Cameron, Tyler, great to have you on Sum Zero. Um, this is a real privilege, obviously. Um, I've known you guys uh, since I've since I was 18. So it's you know it's it's been uh, over 20 years <laughs> at this point. Um, not that you guys need much of an introduction, but um, you know you guys have obviously been at the forefront of uh, social media and also now um, uh, uh, the crypto uh, uh, revolution and 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 uh, you know, all of the incredible innovations that have happened over the last 10 years in, in blockchain technology. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, I guess, worth mentioning also that, uh, you know, not only uh, are you guys, um, in, uh, you know, in, uh, investors in some zero, but, but you also run the Gemini Exchange, um, which for full dis disclosure, I'm also on the board of. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think we've, we've got, um, Hopefully, we'll have lots of interesting insights on 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 what's going on in the world today as it relates to blockchain. Um, I want to start off getting your your world view. It's interesting today they released um, the CPI print where inflation uh, you know grew at a, at a faster rate than it, it ever has since since 2008 when we were coming out of the first um, the first financial crisis or not the first but but the last major financial crisis. Um, you know, part of the part of the Bitcoin thesis has always been about inflation, um, and I think that the store of value thesis to Bitcoin is is uh, pretty well told at this point. But I wanted to get your thoughts on just the current macro backdrop um, as, as just a starting point, and then we can get digging deeper in, in terms of uh, where you guys see uh, crypto heading, where you see Bitcoin going, and all the other stuff that's happening uh, with with respect to DeFi, Ethereum. Um, and, and some of the decentralized applications that that are becoming more and more popular. But but just just curious, um, and what's your take on uh, inflation as it stands today? It's, it's obviously been talked about a lot ad nauseum, and it's it's sort of for a very long time uh, been in check. At least if you if you rely on CPI numbers, maybe that's starting to change. Just where do, where do you guys see this, and and how do you kind of um, contextualize it within within the the Bitcoin um, narrative. Well, first of all, Divya, thanks for having us um, on your podcast. Uh, it's wow, uh, we've known you since you're 18. Time flies, right? Mm -hmm. And I think some zero might have been our first angel investment when we set up Link Plus Capital in in 2012. So uh, that's it's been a, a fun ride so far. So it's great to participate and share some thoughts on uh, Bitcoin and crypto at large. I think that. In terms of the, the, the theme of the past year has definitely been this protection against this harbinger of inflation that a lot of folks are coming around to start starting to say, hey, this is this seems like a very likely uh, result of what's going on with the money printing and and the stimulus and the measures that were taken uh, for the pandemic, and we're actually happening a lot of the QE. Um, and, and stuff like that. And, and the deficit has been ongoing for the past decade, many years since we've been actually out of the, the previous crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, and a lot of people are saying, okay, well, what, what is the trade? How do I protect my value? What, what is, and if this was the 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, that trade would likely be gold or some kind of real property that would get priced up with, with inflation. Um, but now we have this new digital asset, uh, Bitcoin, which is a store of value. And if you look at the properties that make Bitcoin really interesting as a store of value, it equals or betters gold across the board. So if you look at uh, the, the supply of gold, gold is scarce. Uh, and, and we think of it often as, as a precious metal. But if you look at gold in the in the in the galaxy it's there's trillions of dollars floating around on asteroids it's actually a pretty plentiful metal and if you were to reduce the the mining input of energy uh that we would mine a, a ton more gold out of, out of the earth's surface we barely scratched it and and two-thirds of the above ground gold today has been mined since the 50s uh and, and so the, the supply of gold actually increases uh, with demand. The supply of Bitcoin is truly fixed at 21 million. And even though there's only 21 million, you can actually buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. 
but no amount of demand will increase that supply. So it is literally the hardest money in, in the obser observable universe. And, and I think a lot of people are, are, are looking at it that way. In addition to it's, it's way more portable, try moving a, a bar of gold around, especially during a pandemic, it's, it's near impossible, right? Um, and it's more divisible. Uh, and so if you look at, go down the line, Bitcoin is sort of, we call it gold 2.0, it's a superior version of gold across the board. And the, these are sort of talking points we, we've been um, saying about Bitcoin for years, really since we've been in it, since 2012. COVID sort of accelerated the narrative um, in, in many ways for a lot of industries, but in particular, the narrative around the debasement of the US dollar, and then what is the trade or, or the investment to protect yourself against that oncoming inflation. And a lot of people, not just in the crypto world or technology world or libertarians or, or uh, uh, cypherpunks or what have you, but, but people who are dyed in the wool, Wall Street veterans, uh, people like Paul Tudor Jones that have made their career on, on, on being right about a lot of macro issues and things have come around to Bitcoin. And we're now seeing corporations start to buy Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And so it's a much different conversation than even a year ago. Uh, and, and we're seeing people enter this space um, and, and understanding the, the true power of this emergent store of value and, and in terms of inflation, I think there's a really open question as to, are we measuring it correctly? Is CPI even relevant? When you see home prices in Manhattan uh, shattering records year over year by like tens and tens of millions. I mean, I think uh, Ken Griffin might've bought a home for $250 million. Uh, it, it begs the question, maybe inflation, it's, it's been there the whole time. It's just in a different part of the market and we're not seeing it in the traditional goods that you measure because people aren't stockpiling razor blades uh, and, and those types of goods, but they are buying assets like homes to protect the value. And those are trading up dramatically in a lot of mar markets. Yeah, I remember, remember watching videos of Michael Saylor talking about uh, Palm Beach and, and just like trophy assets in general. Um, you know, moving up 20% year over year and more in some cases. Um, so on digital gold, I mean, this is another part of the, the Bitcoin narrative that's been told a lot. And, um, you know, how, it, it sort of begs the question because the, the, the Bitcoin as a crypto token, it was initially thought of as a currency or, or maybe marketed as a currency. Do you, do you guys think of it as a currency or do you, do you fully subscribe to it being just this thing you sit on? like like a gold yeah so we we think of it as a store of value and and similar to gold um a store of value can appreciate so you don't want to spend things that can appreciate um and that's actually one of the the the, the difficult barriers to people understanding this is they're called cryptocurrencies or digital currency and people think that um, it necessarily has to be used like a medium of exchange, like the dollar to have value. Um, but nobody buys a cup of coffee with gold, yet the market cap of gold has a $10 trillion, uh, it's a $10, $10 trillion value. And no one's complaining that gold isn't shiny enough. So, um, you know, sort of values are sort of one end of the spectrum of the money continuum. Um, and a good store of value should appreciate over time, especially in the, the backdrop of inflation or hyperinflation. So, um, and you wanna spend things that lose value over time, that if you sit on them, they're bad investments. Like if you put dollars in your mattress and inflation is 10%, you're losing 10% of your value a year um, because you're just storing your life force in dollars. So you want to store your life force in things that are scarce, that are fixed like Bitcoin, that are hard and sound money. And you want to spend things like dollars that depreciate 
over time. So um, we we don't think that you know if we're right about Bitcoin being gold 2.0 and Bitcoin disrupts gold, then the market cap of Bitcoin will have to be at least 10 trillion. Today it's around 1 trillion. So it has to go up or it will go up uh, 10x from here if our thesis is correct, which would put the price of Bitcoin at $500,000 um, a Bitcoin. And that's just the gold 2.0 story. It could become the global reserve cryptocurrency of the world. It could underpin the security of other blockchains. Um, it could also have other uh, layers, uh, you know, different layers with, with other currencies um, where stable coins can happen. But ultimately, um, we think the store of value thesis alone for Bitcoin is super compelling. Um, it doesn't have to be used um, or accepted by merchants or used to pay for things for it to have value, uh, similar to gold. And we actually learned our lesson the hard way. We bought tickets to uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic tickets to space uh, <laughs> yeah. at $250,000 a pop back when Bitcoin was worth $400 of Bitcoin. So we overpaid by, I don't know what to do, do the 100x, yeah. 100x, right? Yeah, yeah. Before. And Before. the famous story is the first Bitcoin purchase ever for two Papa John pizzas that today would be worth um, the equivalent of $500 million. Right, so, right. You, you, you mentioned don't something. Have, you, you don't mentioned have a Bitcoin pizza moment. Um, right, right. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of something interesting about um, the uses of Bitcoin or the potential value catalyst for Bitcoin aside from digital gold. I, I think for a lot of people and, and myself included, I would, I would put, put myself in this category, um, gold as an investment doesn't appeal to a lot of people because it's a non-productive asset. Um, it has it certainly has some value as um you know, as a substrate for jewelry and, um, you know, I guess there's historical value and in certain countries like in India, um, it, it almost has religious value. Um, uh, but if you look at the price of gold on a per ounce basis and, and think about, well, how much of that is actual like jewelry value or, or, or industrial value, it's, it's nowhere near the actual price that gold trades at. What do you say to people who were like the, the digital gold narrative doesn't really resonate because they're not necessarily, that's not in their lane. Like I get a guy like, um, you know, like macro investors like Paul Tudor Jones that are, that are used to looking at gold. Um, it, it's in their lane. Like they're, they're kind of, they do value gold as a store of value, but what do you tell folks who don't think of gold as um, being worth the $10 trillion that trades for, or, or, or having a direct appeal to them? Why should they own Bitcoin? Yeah, so my appeal would be, you use the word, you know, gold is not a productive asset. And ultimately, um, you know, gold is a network. Money is a network. It's ultimately the greatest social network of, of all time. Um, and Bitcoin is, um, you know, the digital gold social network. So you're not going to understand it if you try and value it the way you would value a company or an equity with with cash flow, um, you know, discount cash flow models and, and how you value companies um, won't do you any good when you think about Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's a network, um, and the way you value a network is there's there's um, is using Metcalf's law, and it's pretty simple: n squared, n being the number of nodes or users on the network. And that's ultimately how you value something like the network effects of a Facebook or a Twitter or any network, including a, a, a network of money like Bitcoin. And so uh, when N is one, it's just one squared. Um, but when, when two people join a network, all of a sudden it's, it's a lot more val valuable um, exponentially. And so um, if I am the only person in the world who who owns a phone, there's no one for me to call. If you buy a phone without even knowing it, you've increased the utility or value of my phone because now I have someone to call. Um, so the more that people buy into gold, which they have for multi millennial 
or or Bitcoin, uh, they the the more valuable they get on an exponential logarithmic level. Bitcoin is more exciting than gold though because it's open source software. It's a living, breathing organism. It it can it continually um, evolves and grows and develops. What it is today is not necessarily what it will be tomorrow. The pseudonymous uh, creator, founder, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, what the, the, the fingerprints, Satoshi's fingerprints what, at one point was, was represented 100% of the code. Today, I think you'd be, um, it would be difficult to find you know, his, his or her or their fingerprints in, in a very, you know, 1% of the code. Um, so this is something that it's an experiment. Uh, it's a social network that keeps evolving and growing. And if you think about the internet as one big network of computers, the one thing the original internet didn't have or didn't solve for was money. Um, right. Well, at least money, the trend. Yeah. A protocol, like a value protocol on the right. internet. And, and guess what? PayPal and credit cards like doesn't count. That's just sort of like um, square peg round holing existing money, like the banking system, credit cards, ACH, that were invented before the internet, that's shoehorning it onto the internet. But they're not, they were created by bankers, not engineers. They're not protocols and they're not internet native. Um, and ultimately, um, Bitcoin comes along, it's money over IP, a money protocol. Um, and it's, 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 it is the internet of money. And so you have to think of this, uh, technology, this paradigm shift, this movement as significant as the internet itself, but it's supercharged because now you can, you can, um, trade, trade money. So that is, that to me is really compelling when, when, if you want to just get off the gold framework, it's like, wait. This is money that now works like your email 24 seven, 365. Um, and if the, the best sort of analogy of like why this might be interesting is, or anecdote or thought exercise rather is try and move money from New York at 6 PM on a Friday night <laughs> to London. Yeah. When's it getting there? Well, not until Monday. And if there's a bank holiday on Monday in New York or London, which there often are, it's not getting there till Tuesday. And that's insane because we know that money is just information and we know we can send emails instantly anywhere around the world, 365 or 24 seven, 365. Yet our money doesn't move that way in the internet age. In fact, if you are stuck in New York, on a Friday night at 6 p.m. and you want to get money to London, your fastest way is to put it in a bag of cash and go to JFK and hop a plane, hop the red eye plane to Heathrow. Like that's pretty pathetic that that's how money moves yeah. in today's day and age. And so um, Bitcoin changes all of that. Uh, or as the meme goes, Bitcoin fixes this or crypto fixes this. <laughs> and that's just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg of what this technology now makes possible. The tech is incredible. And, and uh, the more into the weeds I get on it, the, the, the more it's, you know, it's, it's almost like eye opening to see what uh, um, is happening in the ecosystem. The, 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 I think philosophically um, for, for, especially for longer term investors who are not trying to day trade this stuff and, and they want to, they want to own it because they they buy into the thesis. Um, you know, how do you think about competitive threats to the Bitcoin blockchain? Now, there, are, there are now thousands of of blockchains, and you mentioned Metcalf's law. Um, like, I mean, by that logic, would you say all of the other pure store of value tokens are just kind of a waste of time? Like, is there any reason to own something like Litecoin or? Now, now we have Dogecoin, which is a fork of Litecoin, or some of the other blockchains that don't serve as um, foundations for decentralized applications, but are, are purely store of value 
uh, blockchains, or do you just you just you own Bitcoin um, because it has first mover advantage? It has you know probably the most the most users in terms of wallets, um, and and leave it at that. Like, what where is the threat to Bitcoin store of value narrative right now from from a networking effect standpoint or or from a function standpoint? So Bitcoin is is very much it's a first the first mover it's the first I call it the OG crypto it sort of set this whole <laughs> uh, movement in motion. It's got the most uh, vibrant uh, development community and uptake uh, among exchanges and different businesses in the space who are supporting store of value assets. So it's really Bitcoins to lose. And I think with store of value, it's, it's winner take most. Um, silver is sort of a second to, to gold. And there might be a strong argument that <clears throat> Litecoin could be sort of silver if Bitcoin is, is gold. And maybe there's uh, value in owning uh, sort of the first and second place. Uh, but but the, the power of the network and the power of the development community is, is so strong. And that's a very hard thing to unseat. There's nothing preventing the three of us from forking Bitcoin right now and creating our own chain. But good luck finding developers to build on it and miners to mine it and exchanges to, to support it. Um, it's just a very, very uh, tough, tough, uh, tough uh, prospect. But I think like just uh, building on some of Tyler's comments uh, uh, before around like Bitcoin being a productive asset, I think that, that you know, that, um, you know, you can keep your value in dollars and that's depreciating. It's incredibly, uh, the supply is expanding. It's not transparent, not predictable. A lot of decisions made by 12 Board of Governors in, in a closed room. The Bitcoin is 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 open source. It's it's transparent. Um, the supply is is predictable, deterministic. There's huge value in that, and as a defensive asset, it you know to protect wealth, it's got incredible properties. Now, the other trade you could do is you could pile into Apple or the Fang companies, but those businesses, in terms of like the actual output of the businesses and the, and, the, and the share price of the business totally outstrip. It's not fundamentally much different business, Apple, than it was a year ago. And yet the, the, the price has sort of gone up dramatically. And, and I think that um, you could crowd into companies like that. But I think that um, when, you, when more people crowd into Bitcoin, it increases the value of the network based on Metcalf's law, which Tyler was discussing. And so it, it, it seems like, um, how do you, you know, value a, a store of value that you can move around the world through the internet? And it actually, Bitcoin goes back to sort of the, the first forms of money in gold. Fiat is sort of this, this more modern experiment. Of course, we don't remember pre-fiat, and 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 nobody really does because it's you know been a hundred well, two hundred years or right there's there's uh, there's fiat that was backed and then and then you know prior to to the sort of the, the removal of the gold standard but all, all that to say is Bitcoin you know money in the form of like uh, at least you know gold as a metal um, and not sort of uh, by fiat decree and determined by a government. Um, and or printed or manipulated by a, a central party, that, that has a much longer history than the current experiment we're, we're looking at. And, and I think that that is often lost because we obviously can't think back the last 10,000 years, but for most of money's existence, it's been this emergent form of money that's chosen by people and adopted organically and grown virally. And fiat is this, it's this much more modern experiment. The, 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 the point you make about um, the evolution of Bitcoin is interesting. I, are you guys of the camp that Bitcoin as a, uh, a you know, a, a piece of technology has effectively, um, you know, that, that it's petrified in the sense that it's not going to change. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, 
people who own it own it like meaning like the, the bull thesis includes uh, you know almost a reliance on the fact that it, it doesn't change its monetary policy doesn't change uh, which is very different from like u.s central banking uh practices and, and just what global central banks are doing you know, you know it's the 21 million coins it's it's the halving rate it you know that entire um uh the roadmap for increasing the supply of bitcoin is is predetermined um how much of the thesis is is predicated on 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 bitcoin not changing or evolving it's well, incredibly important um i i think that that so we we live in an age where where there's so many you know lost trust in institutions and and quite frankly many of them are dysfunctional and um and and so basically you, you've got a situation where you have this alternative that's predictable and transparent. And I think that's really a welcome development. And I think a lot of the interest in Bitcoin is, is a, a eroding trust in, in um, institutions like the Fed and the management of, of the money supply. We, you know, in the 90s, uh, late 90s, we, we crossed into the 2000s with a budget surplus. And what are we at, 20 trillion deficit right now? The, the country's literally being looted um, by the tune of a trillion dollars each year. And at some point that bill is gonna come due and it's gonna fall on your shoulders, Divya, our shoulders, uh, our, our, you know- Our kids, yeah. Next generation. <laughs> you look at ballooning yeah. uh, college debt, the cost of higher education, and, and, and I think people say, none of this adds up. There's no way this works. And how do I, you know, at least um, elect to, to opt into a system where at least the goalpost isn't being moved or decisions are being made by uh, individuals who literally won't be alive to reap the, the repercussions. Right. And, and that, I think, is one of the biggest sort of philosophical problems with the current uh, situation. We're, we're, we're betting, we're trading the future and betting it and the bill is going to come and it's going to be for people who had nothing to do with the decision making process. Are there any uh, changes or modifications to Bitcoin's um, protocol that you, you would expect to see over the coming months, years, um, you know, even decades? Or, or is this really kind of, uh, in, in essence, a solved problem that, that like you sort of see Bitcoin persisting for decades in, in its current form uh, without any real changes? So I think that uh, the, the supply, back to your earlier question, the supply being fixed is so important. That was um, one of my earliest questions when I came into Bitcoin. Why is this different than airline miles? Why is this you know, different than, um, what is it, Linden dollars and Second Life? Um, yeah. because it's actually fixed and the supply is deterministic and you can't say that about gold um, gold's scarce as Cameron was talking about before and two-thirds of all above ground gold supply has been mined since like 1950 so as the price um, as energy prices go down or it becomes more profitable to to mine gold um, people will find more gold uh, in the ground or wherever. Um, and so the supply of, of gold is gold is rare, it's scarce, but even gold can't say that it's fixed. And when you look at the top, um, I, I saw this tweet um, today on Twitter, so I'm sure it's absolutely true, um, but you can <laughs> check it out. Um, but the uh, Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency in the top 15 by market cap that actually has a fixed supply. So the fixed nature of that supply and its predictability is absolutely critical to, to gold. And I'd say the, the, the other super critical uh, sort of like superhero power of Bitcoin is its decentralization. It's not competing with throughput, scalability, latency. You can do that on a centralized payments network like Visa a lot easier, but then you're dealing with censorship in centralization. Um, but Bitcoin's uh, the block size, 
um, the fact that it's so decentralized, um, to stop it is to stop the internet. You literally have to turn into North Korea and snip uh, the internet cables, um, or you have to live with it. So that gives it, that allows it to permeate the great firewall of China because the block size or the data packets of the protocol are so small, you can't comb them out of everything else. And so that allows, um, as, a, as a tool of freedom and an ability to um, move money around the world, um, the decentralization part of Bitcoin is something that nothing does like as well as it. Like gold doesn't do that well, right? Because how do you carry gold across a border? Whereas Bitcoin, you can carry Bitcoin in your brain, like if you're like a brain wallet. And so the, the, um, the supreme decentralization is so important and the fixed supply is so fundamental to the ideology of, of Bitcoin. The technology is super important, but that ideology is really what um, I think attracts people and what, um, what the community really stands for. And that's sort of how I think about Bitcoin in your menu of, of options is, is the fact that it's like ultimately the most decentralized you know, money in the world, um, but it's the hardest, soundest money. Now, I don't think, like we were saying before, I don't think that's like where you start and stop in crypto. I think Bitcoin's like an incredible starting point, especially in the backdrop of all the money printing, the debt ballooning for the last decade, even before the pandemic. And then of course, like the trillions of dollars that have been thrown on uh, to get through the pandemic. Like Bitcoin is your no brainer um, starting point, right? It's your hedge against all of the, the inflation, the scourge, all of the mismanagement that has been happening in fiat regimes. And that's not just the dollar, right? That's the euro, that's any government currency. It's your starting point. But then um, Ethereum and Ether, um, you know, being digital oil and Ethereum being the, the world's decentralized virtual computer or like decentralized cloud computer. Um, that's a whole nother application in Frontier that's super exciting. So I guess my point is that like Bitcoin's really important, but there's also some really other interesting stuff. Yeah, before before we get to the other interesting stuff, um, you know, uh, what, I don't know if you guys saw the news about India proposing to just just outright ban possession of of um, of, of crypto. Um, obviously, you know, China has has kind of made um, uh, you know all kinds of uh, I guess threats to to make it more difficult to to trade and to own crypto. What what do you think? And, and you know, kind of against that. Like obviously the prices of of Bitcoin and and uh, you know the crypto industry at large have have only gone up, but but what do you see happening in a case where um, a country does outright ban possession of of um, you know one crypto token or or just the entire asset class? Like what 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 do people do? Do they end up um, taking the brain wallet approach that, that you mentioned and they, and they just kind of transfer stuff to other countries that are more um, accommodating or, or what do you think happens in that scenario where, where, where some central authority just nixes access entirely? Well, I think really... Go ahead, Tar. Okay. Yeah, no, um, kind of the point, it's really hard to stop a peer to peer network. Now you can clamp down on on ramps. So right. Gen I, um, our crypto exchange and custodian allows you to easily link your bank account or your debit card and bring fiat onto the Gemini platform and then purchase any of the cryptos we offer like Bitcoin or Ether, um, especially in bulk. So like, but that can't stop um, you and I meeting in Union Square and saying, hey, I'd love some Bitcoin, here's some cash, will you shoot it over my phone kind of thing, right? That requires you to stop the internet. Um, but basically, but it's hard for me, to, me and you to meet 
um, and you'd to trade Bitcoin in cash, let's say in bulk, right? So that's why we create, that's why stock exchanges were created. People would trade stock certificates in courtyards, right? The Bourse like pavilion or whatever. Sure. And uh, Gemini allows you to trade cryptos with fiat in bulk with more liquidity and more, more volume. Um, so you can, you, can, you can stop those on ramps and make it a little bit harder that way. But ultimately to completely stop the peer to peer nature, I think would be very difficult. And we know that because I believe that Bitcoin is in uh, Venezuela, is in Argentina, is in jurisdictions that have potentially even outlawed it. But unless they're willing to literally outlaw the internet and confiscate people's smartphones, like Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is there. Yeah, and just to right. add a little more, more to that, I think that you know any country that doesn't embrace Bitcoin and crypto really risks being left behind. It, this is a huge, huge, uh, you know, tectonic shift in terms of uh, all the stuff that's being built in the industry, whether it's decentralized finance. And I think that a lot of places that have traditionally been financial hubs are sort of saying, hey, wait, we should really uh, regulate this in a thoughtful manner. This is in a tremendous industry. It's going to bring jobs, wealth creation, um, prosperity. It could, you know, the, 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 the ultimate promise of Bitcoin in many ways is, is bringing a billion, the billion plus unbanked individuals into the financial system. All you really need is a, a device with an internet connection and you're, you're, you can hold value. Uh, any smartphone can do it. There's billions of those devices around the planet. And there, there's even, you know, there's, there's millions of underbanked people or unbanked people, even in the US alone. And if the banking system, if the existing system could, could get there, they, they would, and they haven't been able to do that. So I think it's a huge, it's, it, it's, it would be like not participating in the internet uh, technology boom over the past 25 years. You're just completely left behind. And, and we're seeing that most of the places that you'd expect are on the forefront. The FCA in London, uh, MES in Singapore, uh, the DFS in New York, we're, we're a New York trust company, Gemini's regulated as a New York trust company. Um, they're very forward looking and they realize the huge opportunity. I, I think with India, it's probably like a, 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 an issue of education. Um, I, I, find, I would find it hard to believe that India would, would not embrace crypto sometime within the next decade. So. Yeah. What do you guys see as sort of the next um, catalyst for Bitcoin? I, I think um, it's just, uh, I think time is usually it, but uh, I think the Fed has been Bitcoin's greatest champion with all of the, the money printing. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing, I uh, sort of joke on Twitter, it's like every time they pass a trillion dollar stimulus bill, it's just a trillion dollar <laughs> advertisement for Bitcoin. For Bitcoin yeah. uh, because it, it just pushes people out of the dollar. Um, and so yeah. whether it's into the stock market, well, not, you know, no coincidence that stock prices are, are ripping when the fundamentals haven't changed really, or it pushes them into gold or Bitcoin. But one, one fact that I think is quite interesting is, you know, and you've seen publicly traded companies now put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, take some of their treasury cash and put it into Bitcoin because they're worried of inflation. You've seen that with Tesla, you've seen that with Square, you've seen that with others. Um, there's something like 40,000-ish companies that are publicly traded in on stock exchanges across the world. Only 32 companies that we know of, um, of those publicly traded companies have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Now, it is my feeling that that number will grow much larger. Uh, I don't think 32 is going to turn into zero. I think it's more likely that it's going to turn into 100, you know, a couple hundred thousand, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 1000s are all going to put Bitcoin in its balance sheet. And I think ultimately, at, at one point, um, central banks, a central bank will put Bitcoin on its balance sheet, similar to how central banks stock uh, stack gold. Um, I think a central bank will stack SATs. 
and that will start. So when you think of like where this is going, the progression, only 32 of tens of thousands of companies, not a single, um, you know, central bank. Do you I think, think that, um, um, Bitcoin, so it's like, you know, it's, it's the second pitch of the first inning. Do, do you think that they buy Bitcoin or do you think the same dynamic that works with individual investors applies to, to corporations where they start with Bitcoin, but then they go downstream and build a, a diversified basket of crypto as just, you know, uh, an allocation in their broader portfolio? I, I think they actually buy Dogecoin. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I would say that um, they totally start with Bitcoin because yeah. it's, it's what do I do with my cash? And so if I gave you um, cash, as, if you were my fan, financial advisor and I gave you cash and you put me into cash, I'd be like, what are you doing? Right. So you're sitting on all this cash because if there's inflation, you're losing your value. So they got to put this cash to work. Well, banks, not there's no yield in a bank. It's, it's zero or negative. Um, and you look at all this money printing, it's just simple arithmetic, supply and demand. Um, you know, inflation is coming or it's here, it's all around us. So you're going to put it in Bitcoin. So we, we think of Bitcoin as um, it's the gateway drug into crypto. Um, and so you put it in Bitcoin, but then you look at other things like you were saying, OK, like what's Litecoin? Well, is Litecoin a silver to Bitcoin? Um, another way to look at Litecoin is it's sort of a test net for Bitcoin. You know, people try things technically in Litecoin. If they work, maybe Bitcoin will adopt it. Um, you look at Ethereum or Ether um, as a as a digital oil. Um, even Dogecoin, I'm sure we will get into that later um, in the philosophical, you know, ideas around that. But people are people are really using Do Dogecoin as a currency, like we talked about earlier. Uh, to buy things, to spend things like a medium of exchange. So that's kind of interesting. So um, yeah, look, Bitcoin's a starting place. When I, when friends come to me and say, hey, I believe in crypto, I just don't know where to start. I say, Bitcoin and Ether, you have a lot of your bases covered because Bitcoin, you index the entire Bitcoin network. It's sort of like uh, an index, right? Of the entire ecosystem. Um, in Ether, you index everything that's happening in Ethereum, which includes decentralized finance. Uh, it includes a lot of NFT stuff um, because people are building applications on top of Ethereum. And F is the M1 layer one money supply. So it's scarce and all these applications require Ether to work. And so they're like Ether eaters. They take Ether out of the market in a sense, or they lock it up and they make it scarce. So they, 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 um, the price appreciates, but by, by indexing both the Ethereum network and the Bitcoin network, you have many, many of your bases covered, and then you can continue to go from there. Yeah, it's funny. I, I um, personally just did kind of like a 50-50 thing and then just let it sort of... Um, yeah, how's that working out? <laughs> well, interestingly, you know, um, the, the Bitcoin... Part of it has been, um, at least recently, kind of flat. Obviously, it's had a huge run in the first quarter, but um, but Ethereum has just just absolutely taken off. Um, and, and maybe this is a good time to to discuss Ethereum. Um, you know, like at a high level, I, I, I kind of personally think Ethereum, um, again, as a technology, uh, is maybe more relatable um, than Bitcoin is because it's it's not designed to sort of sit still, right? It, it's designed to be this foundational layer for a future of decentralized applications, which includes all the things you talked about, um, you know, DeFi, um, NFTs, um, stable coins, which, which run on Ethereum as well. Um, and I think, it, you know, th that thesis existed a few years ago, but it wasn't until recently that these decentralized applications were actually developed and, um, you know, started to take off. Um, and, and I think the, the DeFi one in particular just seems like the biggest no brainer of all time. You know, like who wouldn't want to earn a, an above market yield on their financial asset holdings. Um, and to be able to do that uh, with very little friction um, is, is I think something that anyone can relate to, whether you're a, you know, a wealthy banker or somebody in the third world, like it doesn't even matter. 
So, but I think that stuff is incredibly exciting. Um, how do you guys think about Ethereum relative to Bitcoin? Do you see Ethereum as a threat to Bitcoin or do you just see it as some a different entity altogether that um, can coexist and 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 uh... yeah, I think I think they're I think they're totally um, they live side by side and they're apples to oranges. So you're absolutely right. It's it's almost like the um, in Bitcoin, the technology is at the service of the currency, like the asset itself. Um, Ethereum, the currency is at the service of the technology. It's almost the opposite. Um, and one way to think of Ethereum is, is if people have heard of cloud computing, right? Mm -hmm. A cloud computer, um, you can think of like Amazon web services. Um, it's controlled by a company. It has a CEO. It used to be Jeff Bezos. Um, you put your credit card into Amazon you use its computing power on the cloud services, you run your application and your startup. Um, Ethereum is cloud, decentralized cloud computing. So it's not controlled by a company or a CEO. Um, you can run your application on the Ethereum uh, decentralized computer and you pay for the compute power instead of with a credit card uh, or instead of a credit card, you do so with Ether. So. It's almost like another way to think of this, like a decentralized iOS operating system. Um, and so comparing that to gold is like comparing iOS to, you know, a gold bar or sorry, comparing ether to Bitcoin. It's just, they're so, they're such different animals. Or is it like comparing a computer to a rock? Well, yeah, they're, they're, that's totally <laughs> it, right? Um, and so, when you think of the way the internet right now is, it's a cent the, the internet's centralized and it's the thing companies. Um, there are these data silos, it's a centralized social network, centralized um, compute with Amazon or centralized storage with Amazon S3 buckets. Crypt uh, Bitcoin gave us the blueprint to decentralize anything. So a lot of these networks are taking that blueprint, Bitcoin decentralized, gold, right? Ethereum's decentralizing cloud computing. Filecoin's decentralizing uh, storage. Um, and so like all of these centralized services that we're used to on the current internet are being rebuilt on blockchains, blockchains in a decentralized manner. Um, Ethereum for the compute, like I said, Filecoin for storage and all of these other uh, uh, problems are being tackled and decentralized via different blockchains with their own different currencies. And I think w one of the things I sort of say is you can't underscore enough how massive decentralized finance is. It's it's starting to re-architect major services in CFI or centralized finance in a permissionless manner. So you can just post collateral and borrow against it, whether it's a stable coin, a dollar stable coin or another crypto, you don't need any kind of approval process. Um, it's, it's literally algorithmic. Um, you can trade in decentralized exchanges, uh, again, permissionless. You could source uh, insurance coverage in a permissionless smart contract manner. So what if I decide, you know, I want to, the, the commercial market is not meeting a given risk or there's a farmer in India who's trying to get flood insurance. Um, anybody around the world can, can sort of take that parametric contract bet, um, something that's objective, let's say the level of the tide, it hits a certain threshold and it pays out or it doesn't. And, and that, that kind of uh, reduced friction and ability to, to programmatically build these kind of products and instruments, I think it's gonna be incredibly massive. It's still very early. And, and I mean, this is a incredibly nascent, um, nascent uh, you know, uh, industry or part of, of Ethereum. But I, I think we can't even understand how explosive it's going to be. It's as if you know you have um, you all of a sudden have have a, a software layer of finance that the development life cycle you can iterate and innovate at a very quick, fast pace. Um, it, it's you know if you think of how we used to ship software 
back when Windows 95 was, was, I remember that moment very, very well. I was old enough. It was sort of the first uh, operating system and, and UI, you know, post, you know, in the PC world, it, it was sort of groundbreaking. And then I think the next package was 97. So it was on like a two year. Yeah, right. Cycle, product right? cycles are very long. <laughs> very long product cycle. Yeah. And then you look at a company like Amazon today that's shipping, uh, I think shipping every one and a half seconds. They're do, you know, shipping thousands of times a day. Uh, Netflix is doing 2000 deploys a, a, a month. So then take, take you know, a money platform and people are literally deploying like, you know, all the time, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of times, constantly iterating, trying something, failing, learning, tweaking, going forward. And, and that kind of development on, around money and finance and, 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 and those kinds of assets, the kind of explosion of innovation is going to be insane. And, and when we, when we try to value Bitcoin, we analogize it to, to digital gold. We say, hey, gold's 10 trillion, Bitcoin's at a trillion. We think it's easily a 10X from here over the next five, call it five, 10 years. It's, it's a pretty straightforward framework. But, but with Ethereum, how do you put a bound on creativity? You, you, you literally cannot. It's, it, it's limitless. I, I was looking this up. The market cap of the um, sort of finance industry, I think, is like around three trillion dollars, um, and that's one of an uncapped number of applications that could be built on Ethereum. Um, so it, it, it is hard to to, to bound, as you say, um, and uh, you know the pace of development is is really hard to keep uh, keep up with almost. Um, Going back to DeFi, um, is Aave kind of the leader in that space right now as far as DeFi protocols go? Um, what are your favorite DeFi protocols? I'm just curious. And, and also related to um, Ethereum again, um, how do you see the value uh, uh, accrual? Like, you know, obviously these protocols are living on Ethereum, so to speak. Um, where does the, the, the the value accrue, like if the protocol benefit Ethereum relative to that protocol or application that's sort of built on Ethereum, what would you rather own? That's a great question. And I think that's that's a really important point to hit on that by owning Ether, you sort of are, you're indexing the space of DeFi and all the layer two protocols and projects built on top of it. So think about buying land in Manhattan and people are then building skyscrapers on top of it. The more buildings and skyscrapers that are built on top of your land, the more people that demand that land, the more value. So by buying um, Ethereum, you are effectively buying land on this island. And you could, you could also invest and or build a skyscraper, but that sort of becomes more of like picking the right project like Aave, which is a leader in, in the lending space. Um, I think there's a couple of different, there, there's decentralized exchanges, DEXs. I think Uniswap is one of the leaders there. You've got um, Nexus Mutual, which is building insurance coverage, starting with smart contracts, insurance coverage, but they're really trying to build a global underwriting engine for, for insurance contracts. And it's a community and you vote on the types of risks you want to insure. And, and it's, it's almost like crowdsourced underwriting. It's super fascinating. So there's like this insurance vertical, there's a decentralized exchange vertical, there's lending and borrowing verticals, and a few others that I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss here. But the, the bottom line is like for, for most people, buying Ether, you index the space and it's a great way to, to get exposure and participate in the network. Um, unless you're close to the projects or really in the weeds and doing the work, it's, it's probably too hard for the majority of people to try and determine whether they should invest in your in finance or Aave or Compound or what have you. Buying Ether gets you really, really uh, most of the way there. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think Tyler, you, you've used this analogy before, just own the racetrack and don't worry so much about who wins the race, <laughs> you know, who wins the race. Yeah, um, like buy a piece of the internet. Don't try and pick like whether don't try and pick Amazon over pets.com or whatever, just, right. I mean, this is a good analogy actually to go back to like, 
there was no way to buy a piece of the original internet. The best way you could do that, you couldn't buy a piece of the protocols like TCP IP. The, the closest thing you could do is basically domain squat by like a, a three letter word or, or a four letter word and hope to flip it to a company like, I don't know, wish.com or something like that. Um, but you actually can now do that with Bitcoin or Ether. You can buy a piece of the protocol, like buying Bitcoin or buying Ether is like the index. It's like buying a piece of the racetrack and not worrying about like the winning horse or the winning project, whether it's Aave or Compound or Yearn Finance, which are incredible projects. Um, but sort of starting there, like if you're also, if you're a beginner, obviously education is, is the first step. But kind of coming in on the, the base layer, like Cameron was saying, the yeah. land, as opposed to trying to pick like which skyscraper or which condo will be like more valuable than <laughs> the other one, like just go down to the soil, right? Go, go, go yeah. to the base layer, get some land on Manhattan. You know, Manhattan's not growing bigger or some, you know, fixed supply. And all of that activity that other people are doing and that risk taking actually make sure land like more valuable without doing anything on that land because it's near like it's inside this ecosystem that's getting more exciting yeah uh, and so i just think like I, I think it's important it's really interesting to play and once you get like bitten by the crypto bug you're going to play all the different levels of the stack but i think yeah. it's important to like start like smart and where it makes the most sense and that's with like bitcoin and bitcoin Ether on Ethereum, and then you can go into those other protocols when you build more. Yeah, one, one of my uh, one of my good friends who's uh, who runs a, a large crypto exchange, exchange actually, he, he was like he, he's like you know Bitcoin is like Central Park. He's like Ethereum is Manhattan or all of Manhattan, um, and and maybe that gets to sort of the. Uh, that's really unknown. clever. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you know regarding Ethereum itself. Um, you know, and, and you guys have significant exposure to Ethereum. I, I don't know how much you've, you've talked about that publicly, but, um, you know, and, and same with me, it's obviously much smaller, but, but it's, it's an important part of my portfolio. Um, the risks that I see to Ethereum uh, are just competing blockchains that are trying to do the same thing that are somehow tweaking the, you know, the consensus algorithm to be more efficient and support higher transaction speeds and throughput. Um, and I, I think in general, like because Ethereum has uh, sort of first mover advantage when it comes to smart contract technology, um, if something else comes along that's better, it, it probably would need to be 10 times as good as, um, as Ethereum, maybe even more so. Um, what, what are what do you guys see as the threats to to Ethereum? I mean, is it is it Solana? Is it Cardano? Is do are any of these really in the same? Uh, like, do they like do any of them really have potential to put a, a serious dent in Ethereum's current pull position as it relates to you know being an application based layer? Well, you're absolutely right. Like usually in technology circles, it's the belief is that. Uh, when a product has is very sticky and has a lot of like product market fit, um, a lot of users and momentum, something has to be like 10x better um, for people to switch. Ethereum has a huge first mover advantage. It's on every major exchange. Um, when people build stable coins, like Gemini is built the Gemini dollar a stable coin, you start building it on Ethereum. Um, there's so much building that's been happening there um, that like that's where you want to go because that's where eyeballs are. The, the thing that has to happen though is, is scalability and throughput. It's ability to process like many transactions um, cheaply. So right now, um, because that migration, so Ethereum 2.0 or Ethereum 2 is, is um, promises to solve this and that migration is happening but right now um there can be so much excitement that if if things get hot or there's there ethereum can can fall victim to the weight of its own success so transaction prices go through the roof 
when there's a lot of activity and people are moving through different projects. So um, it, if it doesn't scale or make that migration successfully, which I do believe it will, then that could be a problem. Um, and, and just to, to build on that, Tyler, to take like the other side of, of, of you know, oh, Ethereum, it's sort of theirs to lose. If you look at the operating space, there are a few major operating systems around the world. You've got um, OS, iOS, Android, Linux, um, Windows. So it, it is not a, it's not just sort of one um, operating system. There are, you know, network effects for sure, but but we do see a couple of really big systems, uh, at least in computing. And so it is possible that, that some uh, newer uh, layer one protocol says, hey, we're gonna start at proof of stake. We're gonna make a better uh, uh, smart contract language. It's easier to program, more secure. I think Tezos is an example of a project that launched with these things from, from day one. It hasn't had the same uptake at least yet as Ethereum. Um, maybe Solana's up there as well. I, I'm not as familiar with that project, but, but, but I think that there are, there's going to be opportunities for other people to enter the race with, with potentially a, a 10x better uh, uh, project. But I think, I think to, in, in my mind, it's, it's, it's a question between Ether winning all or winning, winning a very, very big chunk of an enormous pie. I think it's in either case, it's an incredible long-term hold. The question is how, how incredible, what varying degree of incredible. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and like, and like, so for an exchange, right, it's not trivial for an exchange like Gemini or Coinbase to list a new asset, right? So if a new blockchain wants to come along and compete with Ethereum, and there are, there are ones out there. Um, if it was like as trivial as like a day of engineering for a few engineers to support it in your wallets, to list it, right? That would be important. If it was, if the programming language, apparently like Ethereum's programming language, language Solidity, um, you know, requires a little bit of extra knowledge, right? So if the, the, the ability to program language was much easier for smart contracts or just was super like agnostic so that you could quickly take the Gemini dollar that was on Ethereum and put it somewhere else uh, or put it onto another chain, that would be important. If the interoperability, dollars, I think, you know, the interoperability. Yeah, yeah well, like it's, it's both like building smart contracts, right? Building an app, rebuilding an application, right? But also transactions like can happen really quick and cheap, high throughput, low latency, but also interoperability where you could move like from Ethereum onto this chain and then to another chain. So you weren't stuck in one ecosystem. So these are all different factors that could go into um, why another blockchain could be 10x better or easier. Um, but I think Cameron makes a good point that like, I think all of these blockchains, like these par will, parachains will become interoperable where you can bounce between them. Because like we said before, decentralization is a trade-off. Bitcoin being one extreme of like decentralization is like it's um it's reason for being in many ways um but that makes like the throughput the latency slow right and so over here you have these are centralized and there's a spectrum right so there may be different uh options on the menu of decentralization like oh i want to do ethereum here or when I, i'm going to bounce between these different now, maybe I'm going to go to Tezos over here or Polkadot for this or Cosmos for that. And so I think it kind of remains to be seen like, but there, like Cameron said before, there isn't just one operating system, right? You have um, usually a couple, but maybe not a hundred, but maybe three or five, let's say. There's a, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this website, um, cryptofees.info, uh, and it tracks the, um, so the topic goes, which one, you know, there are tons of crypto projects, which ones are people actually paying to use? Um, Ethereum's one day fee total is over $117 million. Um, and and, and it's, it's the, you know, highest fee generating blockchain in the world. Uniswap is at two with 7 million. 
um, so, I mean, it's an it's an order of magnitude, um, kind of above and beyond um, everything else in the crypto um, universe. And um, you know, it obviously speaks to the level of engagement that's that's happening on the Ethereum blockchain. You know, due to all things we've talked about, DeFi, NFTs, stable coins, etc. It's starting to become a problem for the network, uh, you know, as, as, as it's getting more congested. Uh, they've announced this um, Ethereum Improvement Protocol 1559 that's supposed to reduce the transaction costs on the network. Do you guys have any intel on whether that'll deploy in July or not and, and what sort of impact it might have on um, uh, both engagement on, on the blockchain as well as the price of Ether? So this is definitely the problem you want to have. Um, it's a nice problem, yeah. <laughs> because, um, many blockchains are complete ghost towns. Right. Uh, there's no demand for the uh, finite space in their blocks, right? And the way you get into a block of transactions is with transaction fees. And because the space in a block is finite, it becomes expensive to get into that block. So transaction fees are a very good proxy for uh, demand and usage of the actual network. And so it's really healthy that Ethereum has that kind of demand. But like you said, it's a problem you want to have, but it's a problem nonetheless, because as the excitement builds, um, it's effectively DDoS's uh, denial of service attacks, like it, the own network, like all that excitement. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have like, I'm not like super tactical on that proposal. I've, I've, I've heard about it before. It sounds promising. I really believe in the community behind Ethereum. It is some of the brightest technologists in the world working on this. So I think it'll get there. Um, but of course, like it's, it's, it's still got to do that. Cause like you said, like if it's still where it is in five years, like something else is going to step into its place. Yeah, it's a, it's a fast enough moving industry where um, I feel like time is measured in in, in days, not years, so much. And um, dog years, we say oh, like dog years, yeah. days year. a week. Dog years, yeah. day in crypto is a week, a week in crypto is a month in the regular world, and a month in crypto is like a year. So so yeah, it's totally dog years over here. There's now a, I think a Shibu Inu coin as well. It's kind of the <laughs> For 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 those uh, who can't get enough with with Dogecoin, um, it gets Speaking even better. Of, like, the the people's the people's currency. <laughs> there you go. Um, um, so I, I mean, as far as proof of stake goes, um, you know, it it's been one of these. It's part of the promise of Ethereum that's been talked about for years. It's been delayed for years. Um, what makes you guys think that this time around it's or that it's going to be released? in a reasonable time frame, call it 2021, you know, or early 2020. Do you have any reason to believe it's going to be different this time? I don't have a strong viewpoint on that. Um, I think that I, I'm like Tyler said, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in the community that they're going to figure it out and solve that problem. And I think that's generally been the arc of technology and, and innovation over the past 25 years. 30 years, if you remember the early internet video uh, and buffering and it, there's just no throughput or quality. And now we're getting, you know, all of, most all of our HD stuff through the internet, whether it's Netflix or, or people are going over, over the top of, uh, and cutting out the cable boxes and things like that. So I, I think scalability is gonna happen. Um, it may not be as fast as, as we want, but there's nothing like an incredible bull run to, incentivize development and get people um, excited about building and, and really focusing. I think a lot, a lot of core developers in Bitcoin and, and developers in Ethereum are hodlers of the respective tokens. And as those increase in value, there's sort of that uh, incentive to, to get things done even quicker. The flip side of that, of that coin or token, if you will, is that they, they can't screw it up, right? There's so right. much value now locked in Ethereum uh, or represented there that, that you really got to get it right. And that's the thing with Bitcoin is, is that uh, Bitcoin Core is, is, is all about locking it down 
uh, making sure there's no security issues, being incredibly conservative with the development of that protocol because there's a trillion dollars of value literally in it right now. And I think the same is true for, for Ethereum. So I, I'm confident it will happen. To be honest, I'm, I'm not that close to the timelines, yeah. um, but I think but, there, it's going to happen. But to, to be clear, um, I mean, Ethereum 2.0 has been being talked about for, for a long time, but uh, in December 2020, like an important threshold was met for, for Beacon. So um, that migration is to Ethereum 2.0 is happening. Like, and there, there's a tangible movement, like technically. Yeah. They've been um, shipping stuff. Yeah, like which which wasn't the case, like, you know, it was, it was more of like a plan idea, like, and, and um, that threshold um, was met. Um, and so it, it's, it's more than just like an idea, I hope we'll get there, we're optimistic, like it's actually happening, like, as we speak. Um, yeah, the, uh, I think they've broken it up into half a dozen or so phases, but that, that beacon chain launch was definitely, um, you know, I, th I think a pretty important one. Um, guys, I'd love to talk about like, NFT. Like the current, the current blockchain, yeah. like Ethereum 2.0, like the current Ethereum blockchain will be like one of many. Yeah, yeah. So if you think of like, right now, Ethereum has only one highway. It's like the Long Island Expressway, right? And it gets back <laughs> <to> <laughs> traffic <laughs> Friday <laughs> afternoon or, a, you know, people leaving the city or something. Um, and then Ethereum 2.0 will effectively like have many highways. Um, one of which will be the current Ethereum setup right now. So right. it's pretty cool when you think of like, you know, the architecture of that and how that's growing. But like you said, like phase zero was achieved um, this past December and they'll keep keep marching it out. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of the things I was listening to Vitalik recently, and one of the things he said that I thought was fascinating was that once they implement sharding, like it doesn't really get any better than that. Or he said something to the effect of, um, you know, once they do proof of stake, there's no other consensus mechanism that's any better. Um, which is a very important, like what it takes to compete with, um, uh, you know, a blockchain that has the adoption that Ethereum has combined with throughput and security. Uh, you know, Vitalik's right. Um, they might run away with it, um, which is, you know, and, and that'd be obviously a great outcome. Uh, yeah. But but maybe Cameron, you're right. We're, we're, you know, it's more of an oligopoly and, and there, there are a couple of these guys that, that sort of um, end up, uh, you know, becoming significant uh, blockchains in terms of actual market cap. Um, do, do you guys have any kind of price target on on Ether? Well, what I can say is that it, it was trading around fourteen hundred not that long ago. I think it was yeah, like, like a month ago. <laughs> yes. a month ago. Yeah, and I was saying to myself, this is so undervalued because that was the high three or four years ago in 2017. Right. And Bitcoin was already, you know, uh, 3x the previous high of 2017. And I, I, I felt like Ethereum is so undervalued. And of course, it's just, you know, ripped up to, to 4K and Bitcoin's looking a little, a little boring right now. And I'm sure, you know, they're, they're just going to buy and then people move. Well, it's interesting you say that, uh, you know. I put a note on some zero um, a few you know, a month ago being like, you know, there's a four to five X Delta between Bitcoin market cap and Ethereum. This just makes no sense when, you know, you could see the traffic on Ethereum at levels never seen before with all the, the, the DeFi stuff happening. And, and, and now it's at like 4,000. I mean, I, I feel like in July it could easily, um, you know, be somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000. But, but do you think about any kind of like fundamental, I mean, the thing that's int interesting about Ethereum is that unlike Bitcoin, because it is predicated on transaction costs, like you can actually DCF the value of the Ethereum network. You're, you're going to make all kinds of assumptions on growth, obviously, but, but, you know, could do you, do you ever think about taking gas fees over an annual period and just treating it as revenue to the network? And, and putting a multiple on it. 
and seeing I what you get. I haven't done that analysis, but um, I'm sure you or, or there's a lot of <laughs> bright members on Sum Zero who are could do it. So I'd lo I love to see it. I have not personally done it, but yeah, I, I think you're right. 5,000, uh, five to 10 feels like in, a, a reasonable range uh, towards year end. And, and I guess if we're currently at uh, Ethereum's maybe 50% market cap of Bitcoin, and we, we, we think Bitcoin's a 10X from here, I, I see no reason to believe that Ethereum isn't at least a 10X sort of block step Right. And, and maybe, maybe quite frankly, a lot more to my previous comments about how do you put a bound on, on this type of innovation and creativity? Uh, you, you really, you really can't. So I, you know, there's, there's a psychology here. Like I remember when Bitcoin broke 50,000, it was just, it was like hovering at like 48, 49 <laughs> and yeah. we're, we're humans. Right. So it, there's psychology. I think if, if ether breaks 5,000, it just feels psychologically like a really interesting inflection point. People like round numbers. Yeah. People like round numbers. <laughs> then at 10,000 people's heads are going to, to, uh, accept. yeah. Uh, so look, we, we love both these projects. They're, they're incredible. And I think that they will in many, they'll probably move, uh, lockstep in many ways, but right now the, the, the focus has been on, ether it's it's super hot and you could argue that it was it was not there in large part because people were really focusing on on bitcoin during the early you know half of the pandemic and inflation and i think that will come back and it will just sort of go between between the two um and, and i think um they both got very very bright futures but you wanted to talk about nfts yeah yeah i i mean a lot of people don't know this um but Gemini obviously also owns and operates Nifty Gateway. Um, do you guys want to just give an overview of your just broad view on, on, on A, like why NFTs are relevant, um, two, to just kind of connect that to Ethereum and, and what the relationship there is? I, I don't think that's well understood, uh, but if you can just kind of give an overview, that'd be great. Sure. So an NFT is a non-fungible token um, and meaning it's sort of, say, one of a kind and it uh, most of them are built on Ethereum, and these tokens represent ownership in, in, a, in an asset. And in the case of, of uh, uh, NFTs, often that's, that's uh, digital art. And so it, it, it is a, like an authenticity or provenance of ownership in this digital image. And these tokens, um, they live, uh, often live on the Ethereum blockchain. And they've sort of exploded in interest because I think it's once the NFT format came around, you could build an asset around digital art. Prior to NFTs, um, digital artists would, would build digital art, but how do, you, how do you sell something that you can't really prove the level of scarcity or ownership? And NFTs bring scarcity to, to digital art the same way Bitcoin brought scarcity to digital money, uh, which is otherwise ones and zeros, which are plentiful. And, and so this, um, it, it, to us, it's it sort of, so we, we bought, let me, let me just step back for a second. We bought Nifty Gateway, uh, a marketplace for NFTs about two years ago. And um, I think when we were doing sort of diligence and, and learning about the space, we, we met with people in the NFT space and first of all, the energy was, was insane and the passion and the conviction of these, these individuals. And it felt a lot like Bitcoin in 2012 when we, we found Bitcoin. And, and it was, felt like this, this, this uh, thing uh, hiding in plain sight. And, and we realized this was a frontier of crypto we had to be a part of and try and build into. And, and I think it, in, in hindsight, it sort of makes so much sense in as much as that everything's moving online, why not art? There, there's trillions of dollars of art in the offline real like meat space world. And there, there must be some version of digital art. And the challenge had always been scarcity and, and really ownership. How do, you, how do you actually build scarcity around these assets? So um, I think that in short, uh, you know, NFTs are, are digital art and, and the, the sort of the one, I think, great example to, that sort of um, highlights what's been going on in this movement is this artist Beeple. Uh, he, he had been doing 
digital art every day for 13 years called his every days and every day he would he would just put up this this piece he never sold any of it he couldn't monetize it uh, how can you sell a picture that you post on instagram and then he did uh his first drop ever of nfts on nifty gateway and all of a sudden people were because they could sort of prove ownership when you say a drop you mean he just offered it for sale Exactly. Sorry. So he think of it like an art show. Um, we yeah. call them NFT drops, but it think of it. Sure. People showed in Nifty Gateway, and we we like to say that the internet is the NFTs gallery because literally anybody in the planet can can come to Nifty Gateway and and bid on or buy these NFTs. And I can't remember exactly what his first drop did. Color did did his first drop do four million or was that his second drop? Um, Either way, second, second drop did uh, 4 million, which at the time was just unheard of. Um, right. And and then Christie's um, contacted him and say, hey, do you want to sell an NFT? We saw what you did, your second drop on Nifty Gateway. Do you want to sell an NFT in an auction and be put in the same lot with Andy Warhol? And um, I, of course, we know that People said yes, and then that NFT went on to- What, what is Christie's connection to Nifty Gateway? Like, what, what, why does he need Nifty, uh, Christie's? Oh, he, so Christie's was uninvolved in the first two drops at Nifty Gateway. Uh, my point with bringing them up is that they saw how, his success on Nifty Gateway, and then they invited him to auction with them, the piece that uh, sold for 69 million. So. So that was not sold on Nifty Gateway. That, that was, was just not. Um, okay. But of course, the the merchandise of NFTs, people NFTs from drop one and two on Nifty Gateway traded up and a lot because of what because of the Christie's auction. That price signal. And, 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 and I think one of the most interesting things about um, NFTs uh, is that when an artist sells an NFT um, and that that digital art sells again, that they, they actually get a cut of that second sale. Um, almost like a, I mean, is, is, it, is this essentially an, um, a royalty that lasts through time? So no matter how many times uh, a piece exchange hand, exchanges hands, that artist is, is monetizing that sale, uh, like really without having to do anything. Is that? That's right. It, and it's programmatic. And so if you think of uh, like artists' estates, like the, the Warhol estate, for example, or Basquiat, once that piece is sold uh, initially, the artist never sees any right. of that. Um, and, and it's incredible. I mean, it's dramatic if you think of the artists where their pieces are now trading for tens of millions of dollars, right? Right. And generally, you, you see very little, if anything, of that, or the artist and or their, their estate. And so that that's a huge level of empowerment for creators. Not only can they now, not, not only can digital artists now monetize that medium, but really all, all artists have a level of empowerment and can go direct literally to anybody in the world with these assets. And they're easily transferable. They really go anywhere the internet goes. Um, it's super cool. What's also interesting, I think, about the NFT uh, boom is, is that it's not necessarily like traditional fine art collectors. I mean, there are some of those folks in, in, in the mix, but a lot of it is, is younger individuals who made their wealth in, in crypto or technology and realized that this is like a frontier of art. And I think the person who bought the Beeple at auction, Meta Coven, um, I think he's an Indian uh, computer science guy who got early into ether, was living in Canada, now is in Singapore, and and he's he's sort of a crypto whale. And I think something like 250 crypto whales signed up at Christie's to bid on the Beeple piece. Incredible. You're not currently in the Christie's network right. of buyers, right? And right. so um, when we were first, when Tyler, Tyler was doing a lot of the early outreach and the gateway and, and pinging artists on Twitter, DMing them on Twitter or Instagram and trying to explain what this medium was and why they should try building an NFT. Um, I think there was definitely at times like, or you talk to people in the art world, there's like this, this like resistance or inability to wrap their head around this idea that 
the art should be viewed in a gallery or exist in four corners in a studio in Chelsea. Um, and, and, and the reality is, is like, I don't know that NFTs will necessarily appeal to much of that world, but between millennials and Gen Z and crypto whales and people in tech and whatnot, it's this huge market as it is, right? We're already selling paintings for tens of millions of dollars. Whether or not, you know, you get converts from the existing art world or not, it's not really necessary for, I think, this medium to flourish. Um, when do we start to see hard assets? Uh, I mean, when I think of NFTs, I mean, to me, more broadly, it's, it's a virtual deed, right? Instead of being something fungible, it's non-fungible. It's represented by, you know, a virtual token. Um, you know, how long do you think it'll be before like every stock in the stock market is traded globally through some kind of digital token or, um, you know, physical real estate is somehow tradable through digital tokens. I mean, just sort of like, when, do you, how do you see the NFT concept extending um, maybe to the physical world um, and not just the digital art uh, world? Yeah, that, that's a really, um, it, it's a great question. And I think uh, a year or two ago, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do you sort of tokenize real world assets like real estate and businesses um, and, and bring them or the representation of them into a blockchain. So think about going into a coffee shop, you use like a stable coin, like the Gemini dollar to, to buy your cup of coffee. And then you decide, Hey, I really like this coffee shop. I'm just going to buy a, a token of yeah. in, in my local corner, right. corner coffee shop. And I think the challenge there is that that likely is a security and so there is a compliance overhead around that. And, and I think it slows down in terms of you can't build as fast. And you have to figure out how that, how this technology works into that framework. But all that being said, there's trillions of dollars of like private businesses and assets that aren't on, you know, exchanges and aren't traded with that kind of liquidity and price discovery that, that I think over time will be tokenized and traded and it's going to reduce friction it's going to increase price discovery and um and even allow you i mean even in the pandemic is i think a good example where i i contributed to a number of gofundme pages of like local businesses that i use and i said oh they've got a gofundme page i'll just you know donate um if you said hey you can you can just buy a share in the business or buy you know they can issue equity and you can buy a token that's awesome too right then you're even more aligned it's not just like charity but but you have like neighborhood ownership in the business right um, that's like the next level i think that is that is definitely going to happen i think it just happens it's, it's going to happen at a slower pace because it often will be a security yeah i mean i i, I do feel like it's a matter of 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 time you know it's it, it seems uh it, you know if anything I, I you know just crypto at large has um, just it, it's created this like whole new universe of, of wealth and, and, um, and sort of given access to, to, uh, to people who wouldn't otherwise have access to it. I mean, the fact that Meta Coven is like, you know, a, you know, a, a young guy from South India, who's now a crypto whale, um, just speaks volume to sort of this like shift in, in wealth accumulation and, and and it's just the fact that it's global and kind of bringing a whole new population of people to the markets like i think is 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 really fascinating so right um, it, you know, it's like dc is having all of the having all of the access which is kind of how the world has historically worked yeah it, it I mean, also, like, it's, it's um you can you don't have to necessarily go to sand hill road to raise money right right um and it's a super, super global movement. Like the ground zero of, of crypto isn't uh, Silicon Valley. It's not New York. Um, you know, like we were saying, all of these centralized web services like social networks, uh, cloud computing, whatnot are being rebuilt uh, in a decentralized manner on blockchains, but also all of centralized uh, finance in Wall Street is being rebuilt on a more level playing field that is more decentralized 
that is actually owned and controlled by the users of it, not by the few, not by the few bankers, not by the few central bankers, not by the few clearing houses. Um, you know, the blockchain is the clearing house, right? And right. No, no one controls it. No one can stop you out. So all of that, the all of the the sort of the outrage and disbelief about GameStop and the GameStop saga and how investors were stopped out, you can't be stopped out on the blockchain, right? There, there is no one who pulls those strings. Well, I guess you could be, but it'd be programmatic. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. It'd be transparent. You would know why. You know exactly why. You know why. And and yeah. like when you try and get a loan in decentralized finance, you it doesn't matter send, what race you are. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. send ether to a smart contract, and so right. there's no bias, there's no discrimination. It's the code. It's it's like you either put the the quarters enough quarters into the vending machine to get the soda, or you didn't. Or you didn't. Yeah logic and it doesn't care who you are as long as you fulfill your obligation then the contract will fulfill its and so the other thing is like okay even taking all the human elements out of this like that's sort of like assuming you're in the us and you can walk to a bank and talk to a loan officer to get a mortgage but sure. that's most of the world like there isn't a bank branch there jp and jp morgan most fargo don't have any plans of getting there anytime soon. So all of those other issues aside, like there is actually no bank, but what there is, is there's internet for the most part. And many um, people um, in those areas also have smartphones. And yeah. DeFi goes wherever the internet goes. And if you have a smartphone, um, then you can have access to basic banking services. Yeah, I mean, actually, Jamie Dimon in his most recent, uh, you know, letter to his shareholders um, brought up, interestingly, he brought up, brought up tech, broadly speaking, as, as sort of like their biggest threat, not the other banks. Um, and it's exactly for these reasons, and just the rate at which uh, a lot of folks who like would never have access to a bank or, or a bank branch are just migrating to these other, um, you know, platforms that that just right. don't require the, the same friction the you know, that, that a bank would. The, yeah. the, um, I just wanted to say that like, if you take like a guy like Metacoven, if Ethereum, if I believe he participated in the, the initial uh, sale, which, which happened in Switzerland, but if it had happened in the US, he wouldn't have probably been accredited right. and not been able to participate. And yet because they did it in Switzerland and he could participate, he's now a crypto whale and like, helping build the NFT space. And, and so looking at like, like what is an accredited investor and those rules are pretty antiquated. Uh, like, the, you know, I, I understand how like wealth can sometimes be a proxy for, for intelligence, but <laughs> why, why can't a young computer scientist, you know, uh, they're more better positioned to understand a lot of this stuff than anybody. And, and yet they're sort of, they're, 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 they don't have access to a lot of these types of investments because they're not in Sand Hill Road or they're not, in, you know, they're in the US and they don't have a million dollars or whatever. It becomes this chicken and egg thing. And I think we have to really rethink that. And, and, and to your point about Jamie Dimon, it, these t banks are not technology firms. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Well, we, we, you guys mentioned this earlier about Gemini's um, uh, sort of the, the challenges related to onboarding a new blockchain and, or a new token into a crypto exchange. And what, I, you know, as, as a board member, I was like, thought to myself, like, why, like, what is Schwab doing? What is like, what are the, the incumbents doing where they, 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 they're not waking up to the fact that this is a new asset class that, that they should participate in. And I think to your point, like part of the problem is that they just do not have the, the technology know-how to, 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 to custody um, each of these tokens, which, which kind of have their own, own characteristics and, and own sort of design challenges. Um, and when you think about like, you know, if you can't even get Bitcoin through a traditional bank or, or through a traditional broker, how would you expect to get, you know, the dozens and dozens and, and, and now thousands of other altcoins that, that are, um, 
are, are trading out there um, on, on various crypto exchanges. So it seems like the banks have just been asleep at the wheel for, you know, quite some yeah. time. They're just like, they don't even know what's hit them. There's so many headwinds because the compliance, the legal departments like can't get out of the way for the innovation to happen. And then once they clear the roadblocks to actually do it, they don't have the technologists in-house capable of actually doing it. Right. Um, and so like, I there's a big difference in my mind between like a technology company, uh, like a technology native company or a crypto native technology company and a tech enabled company. Um, and like just the type of talent that is um, recruited and developed at um, like some of these great tech companies, like the Netflixes of the world and whatnot is talent that like these financial institutions just like can't attract. And like you mentioned, this is like really novel technical problems, starting with Bitcoin, but the landscape moves so fast and all of these coins have different communities. They do forks, they do upgrades. Sometimes it's announced and, and, and we know it's coming. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's hard yeah. to happen. It's contentious. Yeah. So like you need like, ultimately like we're platforms speaking to protocols and interacting with their communities and you need wallet teams, protocol teams, all of this expertise, it doesn't exist before crypto, right? And it's super cutting edge. You're dealing with money, you make a mistake, like, you know, it's, it's really, really bad. So, um, you know, I think it's important to who you choose to do business with, like, it's not just about Bitcoin. It's like, this is a new frontier that we continue to go West and explore. There's a theory, there was just Bitcoin, then Ether, then DeFi, then NFTs and companies like a Gemini, like a Coinbase, we have the technologists to keep innovating at the pace and exploring those frontiers. Um, the incumbents, um, most of them, like the, the, the best chance they have at all is maybe like acquiring a smaller company and then hopefully um, not like completely destroying the culture and having their own larger immune system, like make this part right. of oh, yeah. up into the existing system. So like, as you can tell, I'm, I'm definitely like uh, bullish on uh, technology companies, like purebred technology companies being the ones who understand and sustain through this space long term and not so much from Wall Street coming over here because this has been a retail phenomenon since day one. Wall Street's been asleep at the wheel or they just structurally can't get there. But like, we're not like, we're ready, but we're also not holding our breath, if, if that makes sense. It's a good segue to, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe one way to end could be just a, a discussion around um, where decentralization goes ultimately. Uh, you know, obviously you guys run an exchange and you're and we're already seeing decentralized exchanges uh, gaining pretty significant popularity. Um, you know, we talked about um, Ethereum almost as this this decentralized AWS. I know that, that analogy has been used a lot on the interwebs. Um, uh, I mean, where does this really pan out? I mean, what are some industries more prone to pure decentralization where, you know, like, for example, Filecoin is, is, is a fairly valid, I mean, it's something like a 10 plus billion dollar market cap token right now. Um, it's been around for a while and, and it's attracted a fair bit of, of venture capital funding. Um, but, but those kind of projects, I mean, do they end up replacing uh, some of the, 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 the biggest brands in the internet today in the long run or, or do we have a, a you know a world where you know for any given type of application there's a centralized option and a decentralized option where they're differentiated enough and priced accordingly where they can coexist well i think that any any service that is a monopoly and decisions are made by a few people generally behind closed doors in, in silicon valley is is in trouble um, and so we, we, we saw with like the deplatforming 
and and the 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 you, you see it with the the throttling of, of search results and the censorship, um, regardless of whether you agree with it or disagree with it. And I think it's fair to say that half the country hates, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and half of it, half the country loves it, right? But you're still at 50-50. I, I think that that's not a sustainable model. And whether you want to call it censorship or, you know, whether you want to uh, describe these, you know, social media platforms in general uh, as speech corporations, um, as public utilities, and or, or, or you you want to say no, no, they're private com companies. You can they can do what they want. The fact remains is there's a lot of unhappy people on both sides, and I think the future is much more likely to be a decentralized platforms where there's perhaps a governance token where the community really determines and votes on the terms of service and what the rules are. And there'll probably be different pockets and that appeal to different, different groups. Um, whereas, you know, we sort of saw firsthand, I mean, Parler was shut down literally overnight, uh, lived on Amazon. There's not really a, another alternative. I guess you could go to Azure, but the, the bottom line is, is that those centralized services, I think there's just too much decision-making and power in the hands of too few. And, and that is not a sustainable uh, situation. And I think that the, the, the de decentralization of those services will be a big, big theme over the next. Uh... Would you agree that uh, some of those services that you know now represent some of the largest companies in the world are also, um, they, they also have a degree of complexity that is hard to decentralize? And maybe as a corollary, um, are some of the services that are maybe a lot simpler in, in execution, easier to decentralize and, and maybe the first to go? Like, I mean, when I think of DeFi, like it just, I keep going back to it, but lending, especially in an over collateralized scenario is, is not that hard. Like it doesn't need to be that, it doesn't seem like it's that complicated which is maybe why it's become a killer app of, of blockchain technology in, in, in 2020 and 21. Um, whereas like replacing AWS seems at least in theory to be a little bit um, harder to, to, right. to replicate. And I just wonder if you, you know, think about it that way or, 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 or not. I, I think you're absolutely right. Like, um, so even the social networks like know that, that that it's probably not gonna look like that in 10 years where all the value accrues to one company and a few people who make all the decisions. There's, there's initiatives inside of Twitter to try and decentralize it, but ultimately you've got to disrupt and cannibalize, cannibalize yourself, which is really difficult. Uh, it's pretty counterintuitive. It's like dismantle the mountain that you've climbed up and built uh, and go down to the bottom and climb, climb another one where the ownership is inherently, um, you know, the, where the ownership is, is atomistic and spread to the users, not like the company. Um, so, but I think, you know, it's not a coincidence that Facebook is looking in crypto in the crypto space with DM and Libra and their initiatives there. Twitter's looking at ways to decentralize itself. I think Jack's been pretty public about like, you know, not wanting all the power that they have, you know, not wanting to oh, have it's, it's, all it's all being things. stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's yeah, no, you, you can't win if you're, if you're a CEO of um, a social media company that where people talk politics on, it's just, yeah, there's I mean, no, there's I no way to win. I don't, and, and the I don't have any of those guys either. And I'm super sympathetic to the situation that they're in. They cannot please anyone, no matter what they do. Um, you know, half the country or half the people are going to be pissed off. Um, but it's a really astute point. Like, like, look, I think that like um, Ethereum is a competitor to Amazon AWS web services, right? The computing. And Filecoin is in many ways a competitor to Amazon S3 buckets, the storage. But um, I don't think that like that, um, that those to uh, blockchains will disrupt AWS like overnight because there's, there's economies of scale, like the cost, the, the ability to compute 
at the way that Amazon does in a decentralized manner, manner, like the engineering trade-offs for like speed and decentralization are really tough. But I think like over time, like some people just aren't going to be happy or aren't going to want to develop as much on Amazon. And they're going to go to Ethereum because it's credibly neutral. It's not controlled by a company or right. a country. it's not the U S blockchain. It's not the Chinese blockchain. It's not the Jeff Bezos blockchain. It's, just the Ethereum blockchain, not even Vitalik, uh, the founder wields control over it. And so people will continue to gravitate towards these credible neutral um, platforms, but it will take time before it is quite as efficient. Like, look, you, you could build theoretically decentralized Twitter on Ethereum, but if it was successful, Ethereum couldn't handle it right now. So, right. Um, two things because of that. Twitter is not really in danger of being disrupted by something built on Ethereum right now. And Amazon's not really in danger of being disrupted by Ethereum right now because Ethereum can't do Amazon's job and whatever smart application you write can't do Twitter's job better yet. Um, but, you know, as we know, technology changes really fast and, you know, what's not possible today Will it be possible in, in five years? Uh, likely. In 10 years? Uh, very likely. In 15 years? Very, very likely. So I think the secular trends, the long-term bets are pretty obvious. Cloud computing won't be so centralized. It won't be so controlled by a few. Social networks will not be so centralized and controlled by a few. Um, how fast that change or that paradigm shift will happen um, that's anybody's guess, but I think if you go out long enough, it is, it's not a question of, of if it's only a question of when, what, what is the next, um, do you have any, you guys have any sense of what the next killer app is for blockchain tech? Like if NFT, NFT is the most recent DeFi are kind of the two big ones right now, what, what, what would you say is the next kind of, um, trend that people are maybe overlooking right now? You promise to keep it a secret? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. On YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, I think that the um, I see a lot of activity around decentralized social networks, uh, where where instead of like getting likes, which are hard to buy food and feed yourself on likes alone, right? Uh, you earn a coin. So if you create good content, um, you get paid by the network. Um, let's call it Twitter coin or whatnot. You're a power user, you know, you, you have a lot of um, audience. So the value accrues to the users. I think there's a huge appetite um, among creators. There's a cool project called BitClout out there that we're early investors in, which is trying to do just that, build a decentralized social network protocol where uh, the users um, like earn the coin in the value. And I think that's just, it's a very apropos thing, you know, when you see all of this social media, like the tug of war, both sides right. of the aisle are trying to um, control these speech corporations. Um, Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, um, weighed in, uh, I forget what he called them, um, but said that they should be regulated basically like utilities. Um, so kind of like telecoms and whatnot. Um, so it's just, a, it's a hot button issue. And I think crypto, um, and decentralization can solve a lot of these problems. So we've seen a lot of efforts there. Um, uh, you know, Divya, speaking to your, your, your question though, around like the services that are maybe the, the most likely candidates in terms of this stuff. I mean, I think, uh, signal is an interesting uh, example because totally open source. Um, there's there's no centralized headquarters or, or, or database, and um, that probably is is at some point I think going to chew into WhatsApp and and the the centralized messengers and WhatsApp. You know, is, uh, we we all know is purchased for about 19 billion, 20 billion by Facebook. I think it's got hundreds of millions of users. But I, I, I think that lots of people are shifting and realizing like, hey, I, I don't really want Facebook everywhere and all the apps I use like Instagram, WhatsApp, 
Facebook Messenger and all that stuff. So um, I, I think there's big uptake on that completely decentralized open source. Um, and, and I think there's going to be payment options um, and, and things like that in messengers very soon. I mean, China's way ahead with WeChat, WePay. Um, well, like they, yeah, it's interesting. Asia's got a full-blown super app economy and America just is, I mean, I guess the closest we have is, is, is Facebook, but even within Facebook, you have, you have this, you have two messaging apps, then you have kind of like two social media apps and then you've got this VR thing or AR thing, you know, through Oculus. Um, you know, they're, they're like, we don't, I mean, and we have Square, but even Square like, or Venmo uh, is, is more like payments focus, but less on kind of content like you would see, um, say on a WeChat. Um, um, but yeah, like social commerce and, and, and all of the infrastructure that's needed to facilitate that is, um, is just nowhere near where it is in, in, in Asia right now, not just in China, but also, um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, C Limited, but but kind of what they're doing um, in Southeast Asia is also, uh, you know, I think in a way, arguably more advanced than what, what's happening here. Um, although those are all centralized examples, obviously not, they're not decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, you guys have been um, super, generous with your time here so <laughs> um i guess we can we can sort of leave it at that but um you know thanks again for all the insights this is incredible um i feel like we've covered uh quite an array of topics and um you know i'll have to listen to this all over again and parse through it all <laughs> um later but um is, is there any uh anything you guys would like to end with um I would say that, no, first of all, thanks Divya so much. This has been a ton of fun. I think that um, I, I really, you know, I, th I think it's, it's uh, I think we, uh, so we wrote our thought piece, our Bitcoin thought piece in, in August. And I think we posted it on some zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bitcoin was trading around $13,000. I think it was 11 actually when you posted it. 11,000. Yeah, yeah. It's for $500,000 Bitcoin over the the next decade uh and and i think where we uh we're five x about from there so we're like one tenth of the way to the completion of the of the thesis and um and i think you invited us to to or, or helped uh get us an invitation to speak at the the value investors congress i think in 20 yeah it was a while ago um 14? 2013 13 2013, yeah and Bitcoin was at was at um, hundred and twelve dollars then. And then you also, I think, through some zero, um, uh, introduced us to Salt, the Salt Conference. And right. we, we, I think, we spoke there in twenty fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. Ethereum, Ethereum, I believe, was under a billion dollar market cap. Yeah. All Ethereum. So 500 X from, from, <laughs> right. from there. Um, okay. So why am I saying all this is that we've been saying the same stuff for a decade. And, um, and I think that, you know, we, we've, we've uh, talked to a lot of value investors. We've talked to people in your community. And I think that um, these things are just getting started. They've had dramatic increase um, over the past decade, but, but literally they it, we're, we're so early here and I just have to keep updating the price target on some zero. Um, and I can't wait till it hits, you know, 500 and, and we say, okay, like check, you know, done, done with this. this yeah. Thing. You know, the problem is Cameron, every year that goes by, it, it feels like we're at the first inning again. Um, despite the fact that price has gone up um, because every year that goes by there, like somebody comes up with like a new application of this technology that gives you like just, you know, a preview of what's possible. And then a year goes by and you're like, wait, there's this new application of this tech that we didn't think about. And so there are all these like unknown unknowns that pop up and become known. And um, it throws you for a loop every time. But, but I think as, as, as time progresses, um, the, the sort of uh, the credibility of the space increases and the, the bare thesis that, oh, it's just tulips, you know, really just goes away. And, and um, the reality is that at least in the, in the money management industry, like 
people are paid to be skeptical. Like th that's kind of their job. And so, um, in a way, they're they're the they're the hardest to sell, and 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 maybe that's why they miss it all the time. And they're also loath to purchase things at all times all time highs, which we seem to keep resetting <laughs> every. And there's there's every also week. this this over over sort of indexing on on Warren Buffett's thesis on the future and technology, not realizing that that Buffett's sort of paid to find things that are undervalued, cheap companies, and he's he's not paid to to see the future. Or, or understand networks or money networks, but but it's sort of whenever he or Charlie say anything about Bitcoin, it's like plastered all over CNBC, and it's like, I don't know, are the are these the guys that we should be taking cues from? In, Is he the, are they the right oracles for this uh, for this for matrix? This, for this, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's I think that's on point. Um, well, listen, we'll have to catch up and and uh, and and do a look back in a year and <laughs> when there's uh, when there's even more to talk about. But but guys, this was awesome. Um, you know, looking forward to 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 seeing more of what you guys do, um, and obviously following the space. Um, so thanks again for for taking the time. Thanks, Divya. Thanks, Divya. Appreciate we'll it. Have to, uh, we'll have to come back in a, in a year. And what's certain is a, a, lot of, a lot of new things to talk about. Awesome. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, guys.